playback, and this is going to be amazing. Here we go. Recording has started. We are officially having our first Blab slash Millennial Talk Twitter chat collaboration. My guest for the evening is Roberto Blake, connoisseur of all things YouTube, now also for Blab. And he is a great marketing guru, guru content creator, as well as graphic designer. And he is our featured guest for the evening. So keep the conversation flowing. We are about to send out Q1, everyone. We are getting this party started. So this is how the lay of the land is going to unravel. Again, it is our first time doing a Millennial Talk Blab collab. Um, I feel like Blab collab is, is going to be the word. We can make that something. Right? We got to trademark that or something. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is still be sending out the questions via Twitter as I normally would for any other Twitter chat. But I'm also going to be verbally talking out the questions um, with Roberto and, of course, all of our people joining in on the conversation. Um, and Roberto and I will be talking about each question and maybe diving in a little bit deeper than the 140 character answers we would get just normally from a Twitter chat. But definitely join us on Twitter. Here we go. Q1 is about to be sent. Let's do this. All right. Awesome. Q1 is a coming. There we go. And Let's do this. Oh, uh, and tweet sent. All right. So Roberto has already um, thought of all of his answers. So he has his answers ready to send as soon as I send the questions for this evening. Um, we're also going to be diving into the conversation about each question, you know, on Blab as well. So here we go. Oh, we got some people who are creating their own YouTube channels. And also, if you have any questions, whether you're on Twitter or Blab, you can you could always um, join us in the chat room at Blab on Blab here, and we'll be you know glancing over to see if there's any specific questions um, from the Blabbers out there. All right. So our first question of the evening, Roberto, was: Is there a right way and a wrong way to use ads to monetize your videos? I feel like this is a a, a, a complex question so definitely letting you have the floor okay so the thing is there's not so much that there's a right or wrong way so much as you have to be fully aware of your intentions in doing so and so what i mean by that is if your goal is to really build yourself as an authority and get certain information out there or to market your business you might not want to turn ads on as far as pre-roll ads in front of your video but if you're trying to build up revenue so you can invest in your channel, you might want to prioritize monetizing every single video. So you have to really make a judgment call about whether it's more important to um, get the information out there, not have it be interrupted. And you might also want to worry about whether there's a competitor that might be marketing to your audience. So you have to really think about that. If you're building a personal brand, you might not need to worry about this as much. But if you actually have an established business and a business that's traditionally competitive with people who might be buying ads in YouTube, then you might want to turn them off completely. Uh, if you really just want to build an audience, you might decide that you want to put them at the end of your video instead of the beginning. So mm -hmm. it's not a right or wrong way. You have to figure out what's right or wrong for you. So now, you know, I think when people think about advertising in the video <clears throat> space and on YouTube, we think of those very annoying pre-roll ads or pop-up ads. Are there certain advertisements that you can align to your YouTube video that make it a little bit more pleasant for you know the viewers out there? Sure, in a way, but what people don't realize is how little control that the content creators have over the ads. For mm -hmm. example, they're not able to choose the ad inventory. If they're with a channel network, they might be selling a bulk inventory or YouTube itself and Google might be selling a bulk inventory of popular channels in a niche. So that's how the advertising comes in. But what YouTubers can do is they can decide whether or not they want the ads that can't be skipped, which they do make more money off of, or to have the ads that can be skipped to give their audience more choice. They could also decide that they're not gonna have pre-roll ads at all and only use the display ads where a little pop-up thing is there at the bottom and there's an ad on the side. There's less revenue there, but that might be less annoying for their audience. So they have to decide, have I built up enough authority to where it might be worth it to where my audience is willing to endure that advertising knowing that that's a way of supporting me without putting that content behind a paywall or do I really just want to get right into it with them and just allow them to consume the content that they want from me? And right. then do I want to monetize with asking them to donate to me 
through fan funding, through Patreon, or am I going to subsidize this with sponsorship in the video, meaning it's brought to you by and right. that there are ways that you can approach monetization that are less obtrusive to your audience. But the thing is ads in a way are some of the less obtrusive things because they're five seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, but then it's 100% authenticity after that. There's nobody sponsoring it. You don't have to worry if the, an opinion was bought. And then on the other hand, you're also not having to pay for something up front without knowing what the value was first. So there's a lot of ways, and I definitely get every argument from it, uh, from everybody who wants to just get the content, but it is free content. So that has to be considered as well. So that's what my uh, response is on that one. I love that answer. Um, also, because I really think it's really about understanding your audience and understanding what kind of content they like most or, you know, don't like so much. And then understanding how they like to interact with your, you know, content slash advertising, what works best for your viewer so that you can kind of cater your advertising slash content to the, the audience at hand. Again, it's really understanding your audience, which I think helps make a successful YouTube influencer and YouTube uh, channel. In particular, um, Roberto, we do have our first call in. Uh, let's let's check it out, Valente Montez. Let's see how this all unfolds. And Valente is loading. All right, guys. So just a reminder, we have now 40 people on our lab. Hello, everybody. I am Chelsea Cross, the host for the evening. We are doing a simultaneous millennial talk chat on Twitter, trying to make both cohabitate, if you will. So we're going to get ready and I'm going to get Q2 ready. Oh, no, nope, Valente did not connect. Um, or is Valente here? Hello? Valente? No. Uh, he might be having technical difficulties. Did You, you did um, approve him to come in with the okay. chat box. I did check him in. Um, I do find that, oh, okay, Allison Todd wants to, oh, no, she disappeared. You, we are totally welcoming Collins. Nothing is off limits tonight. This is such a guinea pig trial for us having this collab collab with Millennial Talk Chat. I'm going to go and get the second uh, question ready to rock and roll. Roberto, if there's any questions sure. in the blab queue, feel free to answer them. There's actually a question in Twitter that I want to answer out loud. Um, Neil O'Donnell asks, "What's been the most important thing that I've learned that I wish I'd uh, that I wish I had uh, been more educated about? I guess and warn them about first. So what I wanted to say was it's a two part answer. Uh, the first part of the answer is the idea of getting used to comfort level on camera. Um, I think is something that people really underestimate. And then the second part of that is lighting techniques. People really need to pay attention to lighting when they're on video in general, uh, whether it's YouTube or Blab or anything else, it makes all the difference in the world. So I would say one, getting comfortable in front of the camera, being able to be conversational, uh, thinking of the camera as a friend or a person that would be in the room with you and being able to react that way. So um, that's what my answer to that question would be. Great answer. All right. All right, Q2 was officially just sent. I'm going to give Roberto a minute to start sending out his answers to Q2. This is the true test in multitasking. It absolutely is. Let's see how great of a really? multitasker Roberto and I could be tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yep, no, it's a challenge, but I think that we are up to it. And I see that so, some people are starting to... Uh, log on to blab from the from twitter tonight you know it's for new for it's always a little tricky understanding a new platform for the first time so um we welcome all the latecomers as well yep no i also want to uh say welcome and thank you to steve dotto for joining us steve dotto of dotto tech is actually um a great youtuber in the space um, over 90,000 subscribers. He's been growing his YouTube channel completely organically, doing it the right way, found amazing ways to monetize his message and his channel by helping people understand the tech space a lot. And Steve is someone who also helped me with my workflow of getting my office almost paperless, which is really hard for a designer or somebody coming from the uh, That's advertising. That's super impressive. World. That is super impressive. You know, and talking about mentors for for just a hot minute, you know, I I tend to get you know uh, interviewed by you know the GMAs of the world, but also from students. Um, I do a lot of college interviews um, for thesis papers, and um, 
a lot of people say, you know, what is the recipe to your success? And you just gave such a wonderful shout out to a mentor. And I really think aligning yourselves with mentors in your field is such a, a wonderful way to just get a step ahead, pick their brain, utilize their network, ask tons of questions, make mistakes and let them tell you or, or help them bring you back up. But you know, it, it is not a you yourself and you situation. Um, and hopefully it's not. There are so many different mentors out there that you could find through all the different networking opportunities we have today. Blab is one of them. Twitter chats are another one. Um, so, you know, shout out to your mentor um, and, and the mentors of the world. And never underestimate what a mentor or, or someone could, could do for you. I think sometimes we're always think that, you know, we're alone here. Absolutely. And that's a lot of what actually has made me uh, successful in YouTube is the sense of community. The fact that I respond to like 90% of my comments, even though I get like 4,000 comments a month, I respond to just about everybody that has a reply button next to their name and allows <coughs> me to respond. Um, I try to do that whenever I can. And um, I actually do a lot of my content based on other people's questions. But speaking of questions, we got question number two. I and uh, if you want to go ahead and tell everyone what question number two is, I'll go ahead and answer it here in the lab as well. Let's do this. So our question number two was, at what point can you begin to successfully monetize your videos? So I think that's a great question. We, you know, can you monetize in video three? Do you have to get to video 300? What's the lay of the land there? So it really, you could do it from video one, depending on what your form of monetization is. Again, ad revenue through YouTube AdSense is not the only way to monetize. And I think a lot of people take that for granted. Um, another great YouTuber, Tim Schmoyer, he talked about the fact I have about eight ways in YouTube specifically that I monetize. Technically, it's more, but I put it into eight buckets. Um, and I have a video where I talk about like six or seven of them that actually I'll share in the uh, in the Twitter uh, feed itself. But uh, what I will say about that is that there are other ways to monetize in YouTube besides AdSense. And that's why I titled this monetizing your message, because the thing is, you as a business, if you're a business, let's say you're a real estate agent. It may not make sense for you to do YouTube ads at all, but are your videos monetized? Absolutely, every single one of them because they're a potential lead generation to qualified leads to sell your homes and your listings. And it's not because you're pitching your listings in every video. I don't think you should do that if you're a realtor. And again, take this uh, advice outside the context of real estate to anything you're doing in business is that mm -hmm. if I were a realtor in like Austin, Texas, I would literally do a video and be like 10 great reasons to move to Austin, Texas, 10 things to know before you move to Austin, Texas. Um, I would give the best five school districts in the Austin area. I would do things like that so that qualified people who are moving to Austin know that I'm the real estate person to hire and that I have an interest in solving your problems before we ever have a conversation about me selling you a home. And that's how you would monetize your videos from day one in that situation. If it's in the context of your business, you can go there. Uh, if you're doing AdSense revenue, you might not want to do it right away just to not interrupt people so that you can get views, get engagement, get all those things going for a couple of videos so that you have a fan base and it makes sense later to monetize because you already have loyalty and you have people sharing your content and you're getting the attention you want. Also, you know, if you are doing this initially as something that you do want to do as a business, you have to align it to your business goal first and then look at where monetization plays out in that in the long run because – when you're building up inventory, you're not going to make a lot of money off that AdSense revenue anyway. You have to get to $100 before Google and YouTube write you a check. So the thing is, you're not even in a position off of video one, video two, or even video 10 to make that $100 yet because you don't have enough inventory to get the views and the things that lead up to that ad revenue. So it's probably better to build your inventory first, get people in love with your content and getting the view count up there first, then go back and monetize those existing videos and start to make money off of the views that come through after that and after the video content's been established. And then do that going forward and people realize that's the new normal for you and it will be fine. But if you decide to monetize with ads from day one, don't worry about it because people are used to seeing them now. So don't you don't have to feel like you have to earn it. I think that's a narrative that a lot of people put out there is that they feel you have to earn the right to monetize. You don't. Uh, no one has to earn the right to sell so uh, or earn the right to make money off of what they're doing. So what I would say is just be strategic. Think about what your end game is. Think about what's most important and decide whether the pennies and dimes are important or whether building traction is. So we do have a caller. 
Let's try to get this person through. His name is Tayo Roxen. Oh, a good friend of mine, Tayo. Oh, okay, you know Tayo. Yeah, he's actually the host of As Told by Nomads, a popular business podcast. I think it was uh, in the top 10 of Forbes uh, business podcast. And he also is friends with our good friend, Carlos Gill, and they host a show here on Blab on Saturday's Hustle Culture. Look at that. All right, well, I clicked the check. Hopefully we can get him through. Come on, Tayo, we're rooting for you. Come on, Tayo, no technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. While we're waiting on Tayo, did you want to go ahead and send out question three? I am ready to send. Here we go. Q3 just sent. Here we go. All right, everyone. So we're on question three from our hashtag millennial talk slash blab collab tonight. The question three is, how do you know if YouTube is right for your business? And I get this question personally all the time from all the influencers out there that I get to meet on the road. You know, there's so many people, there's so many different platforms today. You got LinkedIn, you got Pinterest, you got Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, I mean, Meerkat, Periscope. You know, first of all, you can't, there's not enough time in the day to be present on every single, you know, social media platform. Um, and I think you have to understand what platform is actually going to be most beneficial for your brand, your business. And if also you're selling something, if you're a product based company, there are definitely social platforms that are, are better for actually selling, you know, a product. So Roberto, going to turn it over to you. How do you know if YouTube is right for your business? So one of the things I've definitely got to cover in my talk in Revolve is that thought process that there's not enough time in the day to be in every platform. And I would agree on some level that that's true, but you can prioritize the platforms that have the most advantage to you. And I would argue there might not be enough time in the day, that there might be enough time in the week based on your priority of platforms. Um, and that's something I probably will trademark as priority of platforms. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, so YouTube is the right platform for you if you want to build a resource inventory for your audience and your potential customers that qualify uh, buying questions. Just like we talked about with our fictional real estate agent, that might be the right thing for you if you want to use it as an inbound marketing funnel. And it's great because instead of cold calling and getting um, people who don't necessarily have an interest in what you're trying to sell them or what you're trying to offer them, your products, your services, you get qualified people who they're trying to solve a problem or they're looking for this thing. YouTube is built on the backbone of Google search. So what that means is people have an interest in this. Um, our mentor, Gary Vaynerchuk, talks about three things all the time. He talks about the interest graph, he talks about the attention graph, and he talks about the engagement graph. And the thing is, YouTube leverages all of those things but I would say it disproportionately leverages the in interest graph when it comes to search. And I don't think he's ever talked about those three things in depth before. So I'll uh, borrow a little bit of what I know he's talking about with regard to that. So YouTube would be great for interest. And I think it indexes there more heavily because of search, because of the intention of search. I'm looking for things that interest me, whether it's cat videos or how to grow my business, right? I have a goal in mind. Periscope, is about attention. Oh, somebody's live? Let me go on Periscope. Same thing with uh, Blab. But I would argue that Blab is more engagement than attention because look at all the engagement we have here. We've had 226 people that have watched this at some point. We have 59 people watching live. We have the Twitter chat going on and we're interacting there as well. So that's huge engagement. And this is engagement with us, one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face as well, or whoever jumps into a seat. So the engagement here is disproportionately more. So if your goal is you want to engage with your audience? Blab is the ticket, although there are ways to engage in YouTube and in Periscope. I would say Blab has the advantage in engagement. If you want to talk about attention, the live of Periscope, you can get a lot of attention. If you have a huge Twitter following, it's native to that. So that's a great way to get attention and to funnel to your Twitter list or push to your Twitter list. Um, and then YouTube is about that content is sitting there in a repository. So whenever I need it, it's there. So the search backbone and all of those things, that's what I would say is the key there. So is YouTube right for your business? It's about, can you use YouTube to your advantage? Are you ready for YouTube? Not is YouTube appropriate to you? Because YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. Having a presence there, there's no disadvantage to there. It's about, are you in a position to take advantage of that? Mm -hmm. Do you have knowledge that you can use to buy back some of your time by answering questions in a single video and directing people to that instead of answering those questions on every phone call? 
Um, and also another way you could do it is can you use the videos as a value add for things like your mailing list to make it more engaged to make it a warm email instead of a cold email to say, hey, I've, I'm giving you some upfront value in the form of answers to your questions and a platform where you can leave me comments instead of just blasting you with my email content of, oh, buy my services, buy my list. It's like, no, here's a video on 10 things that are helpful for you or five things helpful for you. And if you decide to be my customer, obviously I can help you more. So that's why I would say about that. You are so knowledgeable in this space. I absolutely love it. I wish I had another set of hands to then take notes, but it's a good thing we're recording this. So we do have two callers on the line. Kyle, let's see if we can push him through. Come on, Kyle, I'm rooting for you. A very loyal participant in Millennial Talk Chats. Is it oh, working? Oh. Is it working? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I got you, Kyle. How you doing? Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Welcome um, to your Blab Collab. Thank you so much. I did one of these yesterday and I'm really excited by this really important tool that millennials get to have. So I will do just a quick introduction myself first, just for ask my question. I am an, I'm an entrepreneur. I am a millennial media entrepreneur who's starting a business next year, like a media entrepreneurial business, like a network for our generation to talk about the things that they're passionate about. So I want to know from Roberto, how can you get revenue from videos that have copyrighted materials in them because you can't really do that within itself because you already have the copyrighted materials in them. Great question. So the reality is through monetization, through ads, you can't. Um, the thing is, I would say, are you using that as leverage to get more interest in you? And then are you using um, YouTube growth hacking strategies to funnel the interest in that copyright video to someone becoming a subscriber of your monetized content or joining your email list? Or are you using that as a segue to say, you enjoyed this video, maybe you will like some of my paid content or something like that. So I would say that you have to monetize that indirectly. You can't monetize that directly. So All right. um, for copyright reasons, for the obvious reasons, but you can use it as promotional leverage. Or if you think that the video will get a lot of attention, you can turn that attention into a uh, lead generation and a marketing funnel for things you can monetize. So I would say it's still valuable from that um, perspective. So marketing without the cash, but marketing for other reasons, like using exactly. getting revenue from other places. Thank you so much for answering my question. Thank Not a problem. Thank you so much for calling in, Kyle. We'll continue to talk to you. <laughs> All right. We also, oh, we did have another caller. I'm so sorry. I think I might have hit X too fast. But please, we are taking yeah. call-ins, of course. Calling, blabbing, tweeting. We are this multitasking generation, aren't we? I'm about to send out Q4. Are you ready for me, Roberto? Absolutely. All right. Here comes Q4. Sent a Halloween, so I'm ready like Freddy. Ready like Freddy. And it is officially sent. Sent. Our question for is, what are some of the biggest challenges to marketing a business on YouTube? So a lot of people struggle with the process of making videos. Others struggle with coming up with content. But I would say disproportionately, the biggest challenge for people is understanding their audience and having the right intent going into it. A lot of people, uh, especially younger YouTubers, a lot of them um, go into youtube thinking that they're going to get instant gratification that they're going to get instant attention or that they're going to be rich on youtube they look at the tyler oakley's the pewdiepies and the michelle fawns and what they don't do is they don't analyze the work and the struggle it took to get there they don't look at the first 50 to 10 to 100 not great videos that they put out and they also are not looking at the fact that none of those people went on YouTube to become big YouTubers. They went on YouTube to share a message and something they cared about and to create value for other people. Enough people thought it was cool for that to go somewhere else for them. <laughs> so I would say the biggest problem, whether you're a person or a company, is the expectation of instant gratification, instant sale, instant sales, and that it's about having the right motive. It's about having the right intent and understanding and respecting the process of the work and educating yourself. I so could not, it's the biggest challenge. I could not agree more. And I also think that one thing is just cutting through the clutter. I mean, think about how much content is posted on YouTube every single day. 
And there's a lot of the same content out there. There's a lot of how tos on the same on the same thing. So it's how to make your video appealing and effective to your audience so that it does cut through all the you know the amount of of content we're we're seeing on YouTube and all of the content that is disseminated through all the social platforms and content platforms that we see every single day. Um, oh, okay. So I'm sorry, I did lock the seat. I have unlocked it. So Espinal Valdez is our next caller. Hopefully we can get her through. There she is, I think. Hello, hello. I think she's coming in. I think there might be a little bit of a delay. A little bit of a delay. All right, with that being said, let me turn to Twitter, see if we have any questions regarding Question number four. But I will say, um, and I see some stuff going on here in the chat. What I will say also is there is a value to even with the clutter because you address that everything that I do in YouTube is saturated. Everything I do is saturated. And the reason that um, I get to grab that attention and do things is I pay attention not to trying to game the system as much as I know about SEO. It's not about that. It's about understanding the human components of SEO and marketing to humans. So I understand that one, I position based on the interest that people have, like we talked about, I make thumbnails that I think will get attention. And then I let everyone see from every single comment that I'm engaged. So I'm hitting the three things that, again, our friend Gary V talks about the most because it matters in human to human marketing. You have to know what people are interested in. So you have to be empathetic and listen to figure out what people are interested in. You have to uh, grab their attention, which means you can't slack on the visuals. It has to be quality. Uh, you have to have the good thumbnail. And then when they see the video, it's got to be in good quality, good lighting, good audio, good experience. And then you have to engage. You have to show them you care about them. And when people see that I make a video because they had a question in the comments, they feel really good about that. If I mentioned that I did this video because, you know, James asked for advice on X, Y, Z, then, you know, that's what it is. And uh, someone pointed out, he's like, yeah, you can't, um, you can't fake who you are. You have to be authentic. And that's a big attractor. There might be somebody who's doing the same content as you, but are they enthusiastic? Are they engaged? Are they replying to comments? Are they, you know, making like the experience that you want? You might want something more serious. You might want some of snappy jokes. You know what people love about me? They love that I'm so upfront about what a big old nerd I am. I sit here and I let I sit here and I look so unprofessional with like all my nerd toys here on my desk. And I keep my desk however I have it. I have my origami paper cranes. It's like whatever I'm doing, that's what you get from me whenever you watch my videos. So they respect the authenticity and the knowledge that I give is quality in their opinion. So they don't feel that that dilutes it. I don't have to put on a suit and tie to be taken seriously. Love that. And I really think that people really relate to the authenticity of the of the person in the video, just like you said. Um, and, and showing your humanness, making your faults, stumbling on your words. Like, we're all human here. It's okay. Um, all right. So we do have Tayo back on the line. Let's see if we can hopefully get him through. Sure. <laughs> hey. yeah, work, yeah. Hello, my friend. How are you doing this evening? Good. How are you doing? Good. I have to use my phone because Oh, you got to use your phone. Okay. Well, make sure you're speaking up. Yeah. How about now? Oh, there you go. Great. All right. Well, my question basically, uh, Roberto and Chelsea, is how can podcasters, for example, use YouTube videos? You know, people that have established audience in traditional media, whether it's a platform or like a, you know, like a Huffington Post type of thing, you know, Roberto have UID Media and a podcast, how can they convert? the podcast is into YouTubers and views, basically. So I would say it's the same and vice versa, but I say um, always go native to their platform and respect the platform. What I won't recommend is necessarily just taking your podcast in an audio format and straight uploading it to YouTube. What I would say is if you intend to do that as a teaser, then I would say shoot a video for YouTube that's like the first, you can upload the podcast, but I would say right beforehand, you say, hi, everybody, I'm so-and-so, I'm host of, you know, this blah, blah, blah podcast, and I want to share a sample of what you're going to be getting if you become a fan of the podcast and you do that on YouTube. Now, the other way you can do that in reverse, and then you post um, a nice image and then the audio from the podcast, and then you just let it run so they can sample it. Then at the end, you have a thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy that. Then tell them, you know, again, remind them where they can find it in iTunes. 
The reverse of that is if you're in iTunes is to mention in the podcast that you have a YouTube channel and that if they want to actually, you know, see and hear you, that they can enjoy that when they have more time to get engaged with you and that they're going to get some special content or something exclusive there that's very different from the podcast. So I say it's about differentiating. I, you know, I recently started a new podcast and that's kind of the way that I'm approaching it. So, um, you know, that's what I would say. All right, and one more question, Matt. When you're doing that, right? When you're doing that, right, with uh, podcasts, do you think you could maybe extrapolate some great points from your podcast and use it as a thought leader type of thing, like five ways you could build a business in five countries, for example? That's the great topic. thing about transcribing your podcast is you have those notes and then you can repurpose that content into a video and you can go deeper than you did in the moment in the podcast, or you can show visual examples of what you're talking about while you're doing the video. So that would be something that's, you know, really good. You, for example, with you, I would say maybe you get either uh, still images or video to show um, the actual countries that you're talking about so that it becomes this really interesting storytelling part instead of just you doing a talking head video. And you can really accomplish that if you're doing five points like that. You can do it in like three minutes and it's a great little short informative video that people can enjoy. Also, just to piggyback on um, what Roberto said, all that content. One of the things that I love to do, because I always love spotlighting other individuals in a specific space or platform, is if you are a podcaster, Tayo, which of course you are, you know, and, and you want to merge into the YouTube space, you want to merge into the Blab space, aligning with yourself and cross promoting with significant influencers who have an audience on other platforms so that when you invite that person onto your podcast, they hopefully bring more of their viewers from, from their designated audience and you help cross promote everyone. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's all, it's so interesting. I moved to, Hol to California and people were like, aren't people like so, you know, um, nervous that everyone's going to steal each other's thunder. I'm like, no, what this industry is all about. <laughs> empowering each other and cross promoting each other and right. and dipping into other people's networks so that we can all grow and thrive so that might be, a, be another way to again amplify your message maximize your audience grow your viewer following um and that's always a win-win situation oh well thank you thank you your uh pleasure is mine and keep up the great work oh thanks so much for calling in anytime bye all right, so we're getting ready to send out Q5. Q5 is being sent right now, Roberto. And Q5 is, is it ever too late to monetize your YouTube channel? You know? Or rather, is it ever too early, actually, was it? Oh, is it ever too early? Yes, excuse me. Um, right. Is it ever too early? Um, let's answer that question. Espinal, I know you've been um, patiently awaiting in the queue. Also, Jed, we will get to your questions after Roberto answers this uh, Q5. So I don't believe it's ever too early in theory. Um, again, aligning to what your goals are and how you're monetizing. It's more of a question of context there. But what I will say is sometimes your message has to take priority and your long-term goal of monetization, meaning if your goal is to sell books, you don't need to monetize in any other way than promoting and marketing the book directly in the messaging or seeding the value of what you have to offer or if it's that you want to book more speaking engagements. The message has to take priority, and that message itself can be monetized in the long run by the value it creates for you in relationships or authority or whatever you're trying to do versus – getting pennies on the dollar for it or getting a sponsor to give you a couple hundred bucks. It's like, do you get more value by doing thousands of dollars or you take a loss somewhere? Because I'll give you a primary example. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, when he started Wine Library TV, those videos, um, as far as people think in views and subscriber numbers are important, they are in some ways for leverage, but he built his entire personal brand off of that. And most of the videos never got more than 2000 views. 50% uh, of all YouTube videos ever never get 500 views. So if you get 500 views, you've already crushed more than half of YouTube. Congratulations. Um, but yeah, with less than 2,000 views per video on average, and even to date, only 16,000 subscribers to Wine Library TV, Gary J. Vaynerchuk was able to use his message to promote and market himself and get on shows like Conan and Ellen and then build up the traction for the Crush It book and then go there and then spin off VaynerMedia. And he did that in... Um, a six-year period, so consistency matters. So is it ever too early? No, it's just a matter of what's your long-term gain. Now, if that's not your situation, you're not trying to build a personal brand or you're not running a business yet per se, 
and you're doing something else with your YouTube channel, and let's say that you're a mommy blogger or a beauty blogger or um, even a tech enthusiast, the thing that you might need to do is establish your authority. And you might be more important to establish your authority than to make a very small amount of revenue early on. So I would say it's never too early. I would say you have to think about how you're approaching it. I love that answer. I also, I, I agree. Um, and in respect to being a, an influencer myself, and um, a lot of people think that things happen overnight. And you said that right off the bat, um, especially in YouTube. And I think, you know, millennials and Gen Z have a little distortion of a, a perception of reality. You know, we really think that people become sensations overnight. Yes, some videos do. Those are the very, very rare occasion. Um, but a, a lot of people are honing their craft and curating and creating content for years before they actually start to get recognized. I didn't Absolutely. make the first dollar in this space until I was working on behalf of millennials and in radio and on television for three years. Um, I'm very transparent about that. I worked, I never said no. I took every single job. I was always innovative. I always tried to be ahead of the curve and think about ways that, um, you know, especially in the millennial space, being that that was my area of expertise, how other corporations, companies, businesses, influencers um, could, could market to this generation so that I could be that liaison. Um, so I always think it's about thinking ahead of the game, being two steps ahead, always trying to think outside the box um, and not getting discouraged. Uh, oh, I've been yeah. doing this for a few months and it's just not working. You know, it, things take time and good things take time as well. Um, so let's get to one of our callers. Espinal has been waiting so patiently. Let's see if we can get her in this time. Hi. Hi. Hello. I'm actually in my cell phone as well. Thank you so much for talking to me right now. I love your talk. Thank you so much. Roberto, thank you so much. I love the hat. Thank you. <laughs> I just got to say, I have, I have um, my millennial uh, clients for my agency and everything. They, they, they can understand me pretty well. I'm able to communicate with everyone. I'm able to explain monetization and, and all those different concepts for YouTube. However, I'm having trouble communicating the message about how you make money to older generations. Do you have any tips or, or any suggestions for that? Absolutely. So um, there's a lot of resistance because, uh, and this is one of my business talks, and I'm going to probably be uh, doing these um, in uh, my speaking tour next year um, to some businesses, but um, there's a phrase that I use. It's that uh, people are romantic about media. They're romantic about the media of their own generation. As millennials, we're romantic about uh, digital media and online engagement and all of this. Generation Z is romantic about micro content and they actually wear their short attention spans as a badge of honor. So they are the Snapchat and the Vine and the Instagram generation for a reason. Whereas we're the medium form generation in terms of things like this and YouTube, and we still actually like blogs and podcasts, and that's our world. Whereas Gen X crosses a little into that, mm -hmm. um, especially the younger skew of Gen X that's like 35 to 45. They enjoy that content as well, but they also are still very, very in on old traditional media sources, traditional media in terms of television, broadcast, radio, and books. Whereas then boomers are more, uh, you got the, the books, they love uh, radio, obviously still billboards, um, advertisements from, again, established media sources, whereas, you know, their, their younger counterparts, the meat, as long as it's traditional media, it doesn't matter how established it is, but they're still very much the original five networks from television and things like that. So every generation is romantic about their own media platform. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is you have to communicate the analogs. For example, if you tell them about the value of a podcast, be like, you know, like people like to listen to content sometimes because they can't sit down in the middle of stuff and interrupt their day. And they're like, yeah, I like radio. And they're like, yes. But it's like, what if I told you that, that what if I told you there was something that was like radio called podcasting and, but instead of you paying all this money for radio to be on one spot and then if they miss it, they miss it. What if they could listen to your ad every time they listen to this thing and they can always replay it. What if there was like a radio replay? It's like, oh, those exist. It's like, yes, it's called podcasting. It's the same thing, but people can listen to it whenever they want if they, it, without it having to be live <laughs> and you get the same ad. Like it can be heard hundreds of times over and over again instead of if they miss yeah. it that one time and it costs you less money and you get the numbers. You don't get a guess. They have the radio stations doing an estimate. 
I can show you the exact numbers of how many people listen to this and how many people downloaded it. And because they download it, guess what? They're hearing your ad every time and they might listen to this five times in a week at home. Now they're interested. Now they're like, okay, because now you put it in a frame of context of you like this thing for these reasons, right? Here's this thing that does exactly what you like and does it better. And I can hold the media company accountable for what we bought and decide if it's not working like that. Hmm. And wow. then you have right. that conversation. I just want to add on to that too, because Espinal, that has literally been the, the biggest frustration of my entire career, getting, you know, the higher ups, the executives who are, who especially, you know, eight years ago were of course baby boomers and, and Gen Xers to understand uh, the millennial mindset and also how we function and operate. And what I, one thing that I found um, that really helped uh, kind of clarify the, the gray zone for baby boomers is, is to create an analogy that they would understand that appeals to this demo. So for example, um, influencer marketing, such a new strategy, very new. I mean, some baby boomers might not know what an influencer is, or know the significance of influencer marketing. So I, I backtrack, I'll explain to them what an influencer is, and I call influencers today the modern day reporters. So how we used to turn on the Today Show and go to Katie Clark and Matt Lauer to get our news for the day, 70% of the information that we consume amongst millennials is, is from social media and the influencers out there. So if you can, uh, you know, attract an influencer who's significant and aligns well to the brand or product so they can disseminate a message, that's strategic advertising. And sometimes when you kind of reverse engineer, um, it clicks a little bit more for the baby boomer. And I've really seen that that works very effective and reframing your, your speech. I think that millennials have a new lingo, blab, influencer, Cast, you know, viral. These are such foreign words to baby boomers. So sometimes we talk over people, not realize. You have to create context. You have to create context. Like Thank Chelsea you said, so much. Analogs. You're so, yeah, cool. so helpful, and I'm totally going to implement it. I think that the fact that I can give them an analogy that they can understand, like the radio one, is going to be a killer. I think it's going to be great. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So well, not a problem. I'm so following you now. Reached out anytime. So I just sent out Q6. I can't believe that we have 15 minutes left. Um, Q6 um, has just been sent out. And the question is, what is the most important thing that YouTubers should really focus on? Create videos that you're proud of and that you feel are authentic and just know your natural narrative. Yes, I'm going to trademark that. Natural narrative. Know what's right for you, what feels comfortable, because if you're just phoning it in and you don't care, people are going to know. They're going to see right through it. And I refuse to do like videos where I feel like I wasn't like, you know, into it. And that's what's the like hardest thing for me sometimes is because I have to um, put out or I don't have to, but I choose to put out seven to 10 videos a week and I do different topics on every day of the week. And then I'll put out bonus content if I feel like it on top of that or repurpose something from a blab or whatever. Then what I do is I feel like I have to shoot more than enough content. So like if I have a video, I know, all right, Mondays are graphic design videos, Tuesdays are tech. I will shoot like six or seven videos for that in like a weekend and then one other topic in a weekend so that I have enough of a buffer. So if I feel like there was something that I don't feel was quite polished or I could have done a better delivery or a better job that I have more than enough stuff to go back and say, I can put out something that I think was quality. So I think you have to focus on quality of your videos. Don't worry about views. Don't worry about subscribers on some level. You do worry about a little bit of the money because you do need that realistically to invest back into yourself to do more quality stuff and to scale the business, scale the channel, get better audio equipment, video equipment. Those things do matter. But I would say the most important thing is your delivery and your audio equipment, your delivery and your audio equipment and You'll do better delivery. You'll be more comfortable when you're just yourself. Do not put on airs. Don't put on a mask. Just be authentic and be you. Even as a business, that is so important to just say, you know what? Uh, this is what my products and services do. We are not this. We are not like this one. But if you enjoy whatever the experience is that we're offering, here we are. Do business with us. We're ready to work. We're ready to earn your business. Just do what feels right, what feels natural. Make that your true narrative and go all in on that and don't be anyone else. Don't 
I don't consume aside from friends and people that I admire. I don't consume other people's content. A lot of times I will get asked to, Hey, you know, do you watch this kind of video or do you watch these kind of channels? And aside, unless they're a client that hired me for an audit, I'm not consuming that content because I'm more interested in engaging with my own audience and giving my followers what they need to worry about what someone else is doing or what's popular right now. I, one of my favorite quotes is, the volume of my hair is prohibiting me from hearing your negativity <laughs> because <laughs> a lot of, not so much right now, but usually my hair is pretty like big and, and, and I just let it kind of go crazy. Um, but I think, I, I, <laughs> I think a lot of people like get on themselves about how they look in their YouTube video, how, you know, the, the perception of others and it's, you know what, just be authentically you and also let the audience, you know, kind of help you dictate what it is they want more from you from your expertise. Um, and, and crowdsourcing your audience so that you're giving them what they want. I think one of the, the, the biggest reasons that Millennial Talk, our Twitter chat, has become so successful is because every single week I'm crowdsourcing from you guys what topics, what experts you want to hear from, and that's exactly what I want to give to you. So, you know, don't overlook your audience. Don't overlook those reviews. The, those are the people that are, are can make or break your business. Um, so I'm going to get ready to send out Q7 while we take another caller. So Q7 is officially being sent out right now. We're going to get to that, but I'm going to let Jed Record come through. Awesome. Hey. hey. Hello. Another good friend. How you Jed? doing? Hey, Roberto, Chelsea. Great to see you guys here on Blab. Fantastic. Chelsea, uh, big fan of Millennial Talk. I think it's a phenomenal Twitter chat. Thank and, you. Uh, you, really, so you really lead the way there uh, in terms of uh, Twitter chats for millennials. I think it's fantastic. Oh, well, uh, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. Thrilled that you've got Roberto on here. He's he's somebody I look up to, uh, not just as a YouTuber, but as, as uh, somebody who, who understands social media and understands uh, – how to help people and, and share a lot of really useful information. So uh, this is really fun. I did have a question for Roberto. Oh. Um, but sure. Before I drop it, I noticed you had Taya Roxton on a, a little bit earlier and I, I just caught the last tail end of that. And I know that he's way too humble to, to be spouting about it, but I, I, I really dig that guy. And um, <laughs> so does Ebony magazine and they have, uh, highlighted him. I just put the link in the room as a uh, blab viral star. star. So I'm yep. just so proud of him wow. and wow. fantastic what he's done with this platform. So we've had a lot of stars on this blab tonight. Uh, it, it's been really phenomenal to watch here in the audience. And, and I appreciate you giving me a second to come on and say hello. Um, yeah, make sure you're following Tyo Roxon and make sure over on my YouTube channel, you actually check out the interview that we did together. I actually interviewed him for my uh, YouTube channel as one of my featured awesome creators. Um, at some point, I would love to interview both of you for that as well on YouTube, as well as uh, the Create Something Awesome Today podcast. But um, hat tip to Tyo. Congratulations Absolutely. on the Hustle Culture podcast. You're as told by Nomads uh, podcast, your upcoming speaking engagements and everything that you're doing, man. Yeah, love it, love it. Um, great stuff. And I'll 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 track down that uh, video you did, Roberto, and I'll uh, put the the link in the comments after I check out. Um, on question five, I believe it was, we were talking about do you monetize like monetizing too early and that sort of thing. And um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I, I'm curious about is that when uh, people that are just starting out and on YouTube and building a channel like me. And, you know, I use it for a different purpose. I, I'm not out to kind of make money off of YouTube. I, I'm using it for the purpose, like you mentioned, and just share some knowledge and, and try and be a thought leader in my space. Um, I get conflicting feedback on whether you should opt in for ads on your YouTube videos or not. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback on, on, you know, even there may be people in the audience who, who are, their goal is to be a YouTube star, right? But I know that even, even those people, you know, it's going to be outside of YouTube. They might end up making a lot of money. Uh, so what's your what's your take on the ads and when to use them? So I, I think that in my mind, like the people who are YouTube stars, like I said, they never had the goal of being YouTube stars. So I would encourage people to dream a bigger dream and to think about 
who they want to help, what audience they want to create. And the helping may not be a how-to channel. It might be entertainment. I could have totally went the other way on that. I could have totally done a nerd YouTube channel and geeked out about comics and video games and all the other stuff that I'm into in my personal life. I could have went there, but uh, that's not as much as what I'm into as in creative services, design and photography and video and marketing. I'm more all in on that, right? So whatever you're trying to do, whoever you're trying to serve, you do what's appropriate there. But on the ads, I would say that even if you're trying to get stuff out there, if you feel like you've created enough value, you can and you should think about monetizing it because here's the benefit of monetizing your channel, even beyond the indirect long-term monetization things. You could get the money to invest, meaning that if you didn't have the upfront money to spend $1,000 in camera and lighting and audio equipment, even though you could do it cheaper today and you could use your phone, I could tell you about that, or you could use my resource guide. In fact, I'll send a link out to everybody for the equipment that I actually use on my YouTube channel. You know, most people actually keep that secret, and I've never really got that. But uh, I just tell everybody exactly what I'm using. I even tell them what platforms I use for monetization. Um, so there are a lot of things. Like I use famebit.com to uh, get sponsors that I don't reach out to directly sometimes. And if you have a 1,000 subscribers, you can do that. There are other platforms like that. Um, I use Buffer sometimes to help push out the videos in Twitter or you know what have you. And so there are a lot of things you can do. And um, here's my um, resource list. But what I will say is if you do monetize your YouTube videos with ads, you could get revenue eventually that allows you to get better audio equipment without having to take that upfront hit on it out of pocket. You get better lighting equipment. You could scale the channel and it's a way to let people invest in you without them coming out of pocket themselves. Because you could always ask for fan funding or Patreon. And there's a way to do that. Uh, my friend Steve Dotto, what he did was with his Patreon campaign to keep his videos on growing a YouTube channel free to his community, he asked them to reach a certain Patreon milestone and they decided to do that. So he runs no ads on those videos. His other videos have ads. But if enough of his community donated, he'd probably remove those ads as well. Um, okay. If they okay. So you can create situations and incentives in monetization side that you might want to monetize through crowdfunding in that way or what we refer to sometimes as fan funding, you could do it that way and say that if you guys invest in the thing in this way, and if enough of you do it, if enough of you give a dollar, because if you have an audience with like 50,000, 100,000, or even 10,000 subscribers, only a fraction of them have to give a dollar a month consistently to make it worth your while to say, no ads guys ever, as long as you maintain this. And then, you know, um, you're good. Now, um, someone in the, uh, Chat had a question, can you sell your own ads on YouTube channel or does YouTube have that right? YouTube sells the ad inventory, so you don't get any control over the ads. The most you can do, and here's a trick that most people don't know, is in your AdSense.com account through Google, you can block certain categories of ads. So if you don't want political stuff or stuff that might be related to relationships and dating to ever show up on your channel, those things may not be age appropriate for your audience or what have you, you can check those boxes and not have those ads come up or if there's an industry that you're competing in, you can go ahead and check that, and then that's not coming up on your channel. So you can do that. You can also block individual web advertisers. Um, there are a few that I blocked because uh, I don't think that there are certain marketplaces that I think undervalue creativity, so I block them. So there are things you can do. You can't control the ads 99, 95% of the time, but there's little things you can do to make the experience better. Those are cool if you join tips. A multi -channel awesome. Network, uh, if you join a multi-channel network, one of the risks you have is they might sell inventory um, directly and they're managing your ads at that point, and they might sell inventory that's counter to what you want. So be aware that that is a detriment or a downside to whatever a multi-channel network promises you is that could be a problem. But if you have an honest conversation with them, there's a possibility that they'll make sure to not sell certain inventory for your channel. Awesome. Hey, Thank you. That was our Twitter chat, everyone. That's awesome. Cool. Thank you, man. Hey, and last piece, I, I hear rumors and I don't, I don't know what to make of it or whatever, but if you don't opt in for ads that maybe your videos don't show up in YouTube search as frequently, what, what's your feeling on that? Um, I think that there may be some truth to that, but I cannot confirm or deny, but I would say that YouTube would do what's in its own best interest. So not opting into the ads means that you have inventory that's competing for attention that they wouldn't profit from. So that could be a potential uh, detriment. So okay. I would say in theory, 
Yeah. From a business standpoint, while I don't necessarily like the idea that they would do that, and I can't confirm or deny that they do because I don't know, mm -hmm. but what I would say is think about it from their perspective. Think about what their business model is. If their business model, model is that they're providing a massive service, the second largest search engine in the world, based on the fact that their own search engine is uh, funded by ads, I'd really think about that. And so the more advertising you are opting in, into in YouTube, it would make sense if they have a tweak in the algorithm that promotes you 5, 10, 20% more. It would make sense yeah. from the business. Yeah, I agree with you on that. But I don't know that they're doing that. I can't confirm or deny. I would yeah. just say think about that. Yeah. All <laughs> right, I'm going to check yeah. out. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of great tips in that one call. Thanks so much, Jen, for, for provoking those questions. So let's turn back to our Twitter chat for a second, hashtag Millennial Talk. Um, we are about to send out Q8. We are creeping on 6 o'clock. Might go a few minutes over if everybody wants to um, stay tuned. Roberto, if, if that's okay with you as yeah, well, of course. That is fine with me. All right, so sending out Q8. Here we go. Q8, what type of content performs best? in the YouTube space. I mean, think about it. There's so much content that's shared. Um, you know, is is there a genre of content that actually is more, you know, superior or or searchable or findable or watchable <laughs> than, than other genres? So good question. A lot of people, this is the one that they really are interested in. But I also say that this comes down to intentions because a lot of people are like, ooh, what content is the best content to do in YouTube because they want to become a YouTube superstar, right? Or they want to make a lot of money. Right. Instead of thinking about what is it that I am really good at and really passionate about and that I can reach people with, they're not thinking that, which is the real game, because guess what the content, the best content on YouTube is, is the content that you can get people engaged in. The best content is the content that you can get people engaged in. It, the genre doesn't matter. And here's proof in the pudding. There are YouTubers that are being successful in every single genre. There are people with a million subscribers in every single genre. So that means out of the 7 billion people on the planet, the 2.4 billion, I think, that are currently proven to be connected to the internet, you have all those people. You have all those people that you can reach. So you got to think that there's an audience of hundreds of thousands of people that care about the thing that you care about. They have an interest in that. How are you getting their attention? What would be most likely to get their attention? And then how do you get them engaged? How do you get them in the game? Mm. The thing you can do with that is, again, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Some people do it by being very loud. And some people do it by being very funny. And other people do it by being very smart. Uh, somebody who came out of nowhere, Marcus uh, Brownlee, better known as um, uh, MKBHD, uh, big tech YouTuber. He came out of nowhere in the last three, four years, but he's been into tech his whole life and people love his reviews and everything like that. There were people in the tech space for years before him, you know, um, there's, there's all kinds of people, Linus tech tips, um, you know, and again, it doesn't necessarily matter how many views or subscribers you get. It's about the engagement. Gary Vaynerchuk had 16,000 subscribers, probably less before he really got, you know, Gary V going and guess what? He had hardcore fans. He had the original Vaniacs that then became the Vayner Nation. And then look at how tremendous that's been. He's got a million Twitter followers now. How do you get from 16,000 YouTube subscribers when that was like his main platform and how he got his face out there to a million people in Twitter? You got to think about it. So the best content is or the content that gets the most engagement, and the most intention is the content that is the most engaging is the content that you find who your sweet spot, your audience is, because there, there are 16-year-olds on YouTube that are crushing it. They have no marketing background. They're just doing what they think is cool. YouTube gaming is the thing a lot of people want to get into. PewDiePie was not doing gaming longer than certain people. Smosh was there before him, and he, Felix is a millionaire in YouTube at this point. And again, he put in the work, and he did videos that a lot of people give him criticism that there are people doing quote unquote what they think are better videos but he got his uh fans his bro army his tribe engaged and they love his personality so it's not about what the best content is it's about do you have the right personality are you the right fit some people like coke some people like pepsi there's no best <laughs> It's always the, the analogy, you know, like what works best? Well, it's like, do you like Coke or Pepsi? It's like simple as that, right? Um, 
I have to say, I thought I would have thought that um, like the how to information would have been super relevant and popular. I always find that I'm when I don't know how to do something or, or, or questioning something, I'm, I'm going to YouTube to, to kind of figure it out. How to leverage is search, but search isn't always the the entire game because remember, that's interest. So there are limited people at a given time at a point in time that are interested in something. If enough people are not searching on that day, that first 72 hours for the thing that to solve that problem, that could be an issue. But there's so many people in the world and on YouTube that that probably will be fine. But guess what? When a tentpole event happens, like the finale of Game of Thrones, and you put out a video on it because you're a fan and you're like freaking out about it, like I did one night, then that video in a week will like in the first three days will get like 50,000 views. Whereas you could do the most awesome how-to video in the world on a problem that's legitimate to helping people make their six-figure salary, and you can only get you might only get three thousand views on that. Even with a hundred thousand subscribers, I saw Gary Vaynerchuk put out a video four months ago, and he has a hundred thousand subscribers, a million Twitter followers. It's a video for marketers, and there's so many marketers out there. That video has three thousand views. You would think that a video from a guy who crushed it in marketing would have more than that. Right. I know other people, I know photographers who like do an amazing video that like solves a legitimate problem for photographers. And then that video, like my friend Eric Rossi, he'll do a video on a new lens that came out and it might get like 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 views that week. He'll do another video after that on something really super relevant that's how to. And that might get 600 views mm. and there was no difference in the quality and he still has over 10,000 people. So you can think that it would be how to, but it depends. Are people trying to solve that problem this week? You right. Know? And that leads me to the timing question, Roberto. I always feel like certain content, it, you know, the reason why it pops or the reason why it goes viral is because it's just perfect timing. And you brought up the, the you know, the Game of Thrones video. Obvi you know, it, the smart thing would be to, you know, post that video as soon as Game of Thrones ended, if not next morning, right? So if you're, yep. I think it's also really important to look what's going on in pop culture, entertainment news, um, and is something going to get clouded just because, you know, something is, is trending at the moment? Um, is the Super Bowl happening? And are you, are you, you know, are people watching the Super Bowl, not, you know, your YouTube, how to, you know, market your business video? So I think timing is incredibly relevant in understanding the entertainment entertainment calendar. Also just checking what's trending on Twitter. Do you have a marketing video in the queue or do you have some sort of entertainment video in the queue and it's trending on Twitter? The time is now to then post it. So exactly. It is that. It is that. But then there's also a component of, I would counterpunch and say on some level, you can ignore that because if something's good content, you can play the evergreen game of this will always be important. Well, evergreen like, is always wonderful. Exactly. So if like I do like I've done Photoshop tutorials and uh, Premiere Pro video editing tutorials that for someone who's doing that job this week, it will always be important. Whoever got hired today to do that job and needs to know how to do this one thing or they won't make a deadline. Right. It'll always be important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, OK. Sent out Q9 as we were all talking. So if you want to send your answer now is the time, Roberto. Q9, how do you market your business in YouTube while being authentic? So the main thing to do there is to focus on who you're trying to create value for and the problems you want to solve and always approach it from win, win, win. Um, so if with creative services, I did a video that was win, 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 win. And I say that because here's the key to that. So if you're just starting as a graphic designer, if you're just starting as a freelancer, if, um, you're a client, this video is relevant because I talked about how much does logo design cost and why. And I prefaced the video in the first 30 seconds saying, this is for you designers, but it's also for you clients. It's I'm going to walk you both through what your expectations should be and how you should be thinking about this. And for both of you, it's an investment. For someone's an investment of time, for someone's an investment of money, and it has to be a win-win relationship. And so anyone, regardless of who they were, got value from that video. And then I also got value because I marketed. I didn't even tell people that they need to hire me, but people did hire me from that video. I probably did $5,000 within a month from that one video because it solved the problem of 
I wasn't thinking of this from the right point of view. You're very knowledgeable. You're very credible. And then I got designers thanking me for that video too, because they realized that I'm not explaining it to my clients well enough. And I can point them to this video when I need to qualify it from somebody else, or I can use your language, Roberto, to explain that it's an investment. So you can market your business authentically by thinking about what does the other person get out of this? Am I creating upfront value? And then did I make myself qualified and credible and authority? And was I honest enough? And did I win them over? And you do that by solving their pain point first and thinking about yourself second. Wonderful answer. And you did this, you did slightly cover it in, I think it was Q7, um, but I'm about to send it out Q10. And the question is, is it possible to be successful on YouTube without marketing experience? So I'm going to send that um, as we chat about it. Yes, yes, but there is a way to uh, to do that. And part of it is a lot of people, some people are naturals. There are some people who are naturally comfortable on uh, camera and in talking about themselves and marketing themselves. But you do have people who are introverts and they can still win because they might not have that intuitive marketing savvy or the social cues, or they might feel, or even if they do, they might feel very drained by it. They might feel, um, you know, very um, put off by it. It might be very something that like they have to have a recovery time from. Right. YouTube could be good for them in a couple of ways because it would mean that maybe they don't have to answer that question as much if they answer it one time in a video. And then they can use that as an avatar instead of having to expend that energy all the time. The other thing is maybe they don't feel comfortable with their face out there and they can be successful because maybe they can talk over a visual narrative. And it doesn't have to be stills and it doesn't have to be animated text. It could be B-roll footage of things that are going on that explain what is going on in their space or their thing. They can find B-roll. They can use things like video blocks. They can use things like motion array. And they can like get footage and say, like in Tayo's case, if Tayo was doing a narrative about um, the culture of another country for some reason, he could get B-roll footage from either like video blocks, motion rate, eye stock video, whoever, put it in there, never show his face, do a voiceover and tell that story in like three to five minutes and create that value and pitch to an audience that way and share something interesting to them and never put his face on camera. And the thing is, you don't have to be a marketer. You just have to be a good storyteller. You have to be a, a good communicator. And it helps if you're a good person. <laughs> it does help if you're a good person, right? Um, I've seen Greg and the around the talking head. Okay, I'm just making sure that we're not missing any questions from our Blab chat over here. Oh, we do have someone calling in, the voice of Blab. You want to take a call, Roberto? Uh, sure. Let's go ahead and take the call. This is not going to be our last call for the evening, everyone. We're also going to stop at we'll, um, being that we're uh, 10 minutes over chat time. Right. So, While we're taking this call, do you want to go ahead and send out the next question in the Twitter chat? Let's do that. So we're going to move on to Q11 as we wait. Okay. Sorry, I got delayed yeah. for a second. So, well, okay. how are you doing? Good. I'm doing great. I appreciate you all uh, taking this for just a moment. Um, I have a really quick question. And then I'll let you go. I'm, uh, I'm assuming some people may be asking the, the same kind of question. So for me with uh, with YouTube, it's honestly been something that I've, I've avoided because I, I don't always like to start something unless I know what I'm doing. And I've, I've even I'm kind of comparing it to blab. And so if I if I'm mistaking in that, then then please correct me. But a few times I've really I've come on blab and I've said, OK, I think this would be a great topic. I want to I want to be able to do to discuss it. Um, I think it'll be something that people would be excited about. And then it seems to like just drop. I mean, like nobody, nobody gets involved in it. Nobody does anything with it. And and so my concern would be, how do you avoid that potentially with YouTube? And does this does this question make sense? And I hope I'm I'm uh, trying to relay it. And it's, maybe you could talk about that. And I'll, I'm sorry. It's actually a fantastic uh, question. Um, so what I would say is a lot of people get caught up in that as the measuring stick of what is what they're doing successful. And I understand that because we talk so much about engagement. But the thing is you have to build momentum there and the consistency becomes first. So if you're easily discouraged by that, you just have to change the narrative in your own mind of 
earning it in this interesting way of why I tell people is when they talk to me about, I feel discouraged because I don't have the right number of views or subscribers or no one's paying attention. Mm -hmm. I remind them that before all this really internet stuff got going, that I was drawing in a sketchbook and uh, never sharing my artwork with anyone for over like for decades, like for two decades before there were platforms to really get any traction or any likes or reshares or retweets off of any of that. There was this whole two decades of me creating awesome things for myself and sharing them with one or two or five people that happened to be in the lunchroom or at a bus station or at the library. And that was all the engagement and feedback I was going to get was five people or 10 people. That was all the attention there was. And for most people uh, who weren't born at a certain period in history, that was the reality and that was the most attention. So I say, if you remember that, then you become very grateful for those five or 10 or 15 or 20 people on the internet who pay attention to what you're doing. And if you use the actual process of the work of saying, the real accomplishment is doing this thing consistently and getting a hundred pieces of content out that I feel proud of is more important than whoever sees it. Because it only has to be one view that's the right view for it to be game changing and life changing. One okay. YouTube video that I'm very proud of led to um, writing deals that I now have over 10K in writing deals a year with publications online and led to the, the beginning of my speaking career. One video did all of that. And if I was concerned about whether or not it was a video that enough people would be interested in, because it was a very niche video that did all of that, that I'm aware of, um, then it would have been, I would have never done that video if I was worried about how many views or how many people were going to pay attention. I put out what I thought was valuable, what I thought was quality and what I was personally proud of and called it a day and it led to other things. So I would say focus on the process, the work, the value you want to create, something you're proud of. And then if people enjoy it, they'll let you know. And then there's always a chance that one day when you've built more authority and you have more out there to be discovered, then more people will see it and more people will like it. But if you focus immediately on how many people are paying attention to me at once in a very, very noisy new world where there's a million other people creating awesome things, if you use that, you're setting yourself up to lose by having that expectation. And would you all, that, that's great feedback and I really appreciate that. Could, could I ask one more 30 second question and I'll, and I'll bail, I promise. Go for it. Would that be okay? Okay. So like, like many people my age, I'll be, I'll be 40 soon. So I'm kind of stuck in that generation where, you know, I remember in 1979, you know, we had a, we, my dad had an Apple II, not the Apple IIe, but an Apple II in our house. And I grew up with all these electronics, but at the same time, I'm also in that generation that, you know, so we could put things together, we know how it worked, but then we also are right there when it comes to tech. It seems like everybody is always talking about millennials and, and how that's gonna change everything. In my business, I, I'm in the telecommunications business. I've been on, uh, you know, I've been doing that for the last 15 years. I'm gonna create a new company that that is going to thrive off of data. Do I need to focus on that or do I need to try to like kind of put that out of my head and just deal with what I know and who I am and, and what my what my age is? Does that, does that make sense? I don't know if I'm clearly. If your question makes sense. What I will say is this goes back to something earlier. And I don't know if you were in the show at the time uh, is why I said that every generation's romantic about uh, the media platforms of their era. And so you're 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 forming an attachment to what you know. But what I would say from a business standpoint, I understand doing what you know best, That that's smart. But I would say take what you know best, reverse engineer it for the context of the time. Because okay. what you know and what's been established, like for thousands of years as human beings, we got by on horses and chariots, you know? So now we know better because there's something new that is more effective. What I would say is that a lot of the older media, sometimes it's harder to measure and qualify and quantify that. The decision makers in your market also are skewing younger because there are people that are exiting and so on and so forth. And that's going to be the thing. The market of those decision makers in your own generation and the market of the buying market is shrinking there, whereas the younger market always grows. And we always know that there's always that sweet spot of 18 to 35 uh, for a good reason. And right now that generation is millennials about like, you know, a, not that long ago, the 18 to 35 sweet spot was generation X before that the right. sweet 18 to 35 sweet, sweet spot was boomers. That will always be the growing market disproportionately. There are 3 billion people last count on the planet under 30 years old. So you always, from a money standpoint, want to spend the least amount of money to reach the most amount of people. With that being said, 
the thing about what you do is you can take all that knowledge you have and all you have to do is find your own analog to what that makes sense to that growing and expanding market. And what you know is that the millennial market disproportionately values their time, even though much older people still talk about how they value their time too. But millennials use media to take control of their time in the sense that they don't watch live television as much. They're engaging in these platforms live and DVRing and scheduling their things. And yes, Gen X and boomers are doing that too. They're getting onto it. But for millennials, that's the first inclination. That is the natural inclination to do. And you know that Generation Z after that, shorter attention spans. Seeding that market and growing that loyalty, I buy Craftsman Tools because dad brought Craftsman Tools, right. right? But now the narrative is not, we're not doing what our parents are doing. We're doing what people our age are doing. So leverage influencers. We're doing what people who are doing the things that we want to aspire to do that are older than us do that are popular. So leverage YouTube influencers. Seed the loyalty of the brand in platforms before you can even sell to them through storytelling. Get their attention and get them aware of you before they can ever buy from you so that they remember who you are when it's time to make that buy when they grow up. When they grow up in that five or four year period before they're ever buying from you, they remember something about you. You know what I remember every Christmas? The Coca-Cola Bear commercials from when I was a kid that yep. never come out. The 3D animated Coca-Cola Bear commercials. Always I remember a that every time. Christmas with longing. <laughs> you know? Chime in on your on your question. Also, I think you there's two different avenues to a question. There's the marketing strategy, and then there's your target demographic. Um, and you know, your telecommunications company, correct? Yeah. So your service provider is your service tailoring or or empowering the needs of the everyday millennial. If that's a yes, then your your target demographic is millennial. Doesn't mean that you have to have one target demographic of a generation. Your gener it could it could span over several generations. But understand the millennial mindset and how your service, your product, appeal to the everyday millennial, and align that into your marketing strategy. Okay. And I feel like that will kind of sums it up in a nutshell. So you know, a lot of people are like, do I have to market to millennials? You know, who are these people? Well, first understand who they are. Does your service brand product appeal to that demo? Does it fill a need from the everyday millennial's life? If so, then align a, mar a marketing strategy that appeals to that need. Yep. And that those are the brands, those are the products, those are the services that are excelling in the millennials. Okay. Well, again, thank you all very much. You guys both uh, in a short amount of uh, short amount of time really gave uh, more more. Uh, what's the word? I, I don't want to say it because then I'll have to write a check to you later. But very <laughs> And no, you're I appreciate well, it very much. Thank you. All right, Roberto. Well, we are 20 minutes over six o'clock over here in Pacific time. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining my first Blab Millennial Talk collab. It was fabulous having you on. I think we need to talk about you becoming a staple in, in this Blab collab, um, but we'll talk offline about that. Thank you so much for all the people um, who joined in and were so, what an engaging hour and 20 minutes. It was truly incredible um thank you so much for your patience and 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 us working through the multitasking aspect of of this collab as well of course for more information on roberto you can find him at roberto blake um really all things at roberto blake his youtube page his twitter um he's wonderful um i did see that there was a quick question like like i think a half hour ago someone wants to know where you got your shirt um i want to know where you oh. got your shirt um, okay. and, so and you, now a fun question. <laughs> so I actually made these. I actually made these and the Create Awesome shirts myself with the Always Be Creating shirt. I collaborated with a great um, hand letter out of California named Jordan uh, Queller. Uh, he's amazing, and these shirts are available in my Spreadshirt store. So you can either go to robertoblake.com/shirts. Or you can go to spreadshirt.com slash Roberto Blake and you can order your own Always Be Creating or Create Awesome shirt. If you get the Always Be Creating shirt, they do have an interactive QR code on the back that goes to an interesting little video. Um, and it's just a little piece of art that I did. So that's kind of a cool interactive print thing. So um, that is what you can do if you want to get the shirts.
Thank you so much for answering that question. I need to get myself a shirt. Um, thank you again so much for tuning in, everyone. We're here every single Tuesday. Um, keep you posted about the Blab Collab. We're gonna. Well, this was totally a guinea pig tonight, so thank you, everyone, for your patience. Roberto, so much incredible content. Thank you again. Um, I will speak to you tomorrow about other things. And have a great night, everyone. Dinner time for me. Enjoy. <laughs> and remember, guys. Create something awesome today. Bye, everyone. All right, so Chelsea, you're going to want to hit. Uh, oh, uh, let's see if. All right, well, this is still recording, so I have to actually exit out now. <laughs> but.